All right, why don't you come on in and have a seat? We'll get this, uh, this thing going. I'm going to need your number. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Senator, you pick your seat. Yep. Oh. <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> oh, she'll be. I was going to take a picture of the crowd. Uh oh. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Do I need to turn it off or? Okay, so, um, so I'm Dr. Carl Clark. I'm the president and CEO of the Mental Health Center of Denver, and welcome to our conversation about equitable growth. Um, you know, there are many ways to be in a community. Um, you can be a resident where you actually live in a community and uh, just come and go from the place where you live. Or you can be a citizen in your community. And citizens are people that come together around sort of common values to have conversations about how can we make our community a better place. And so you guys are my favorite because you showed up for this conversation. I appreciate that. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about why um, a mental health center, the Mental Health Center of Denver, would be interested in equitable growth. And it really is really quite simple. It's very hard to get well if you don't have a place to live. So we've had a lot of projects that we've done. We know that every community that we're involved in Am I supposed to have a clicker? Thank you. <laughs> How about that? Um, anyway, every community that we're involved in, uh, we know has natural strengths. That there are things that people know, this would make our community better. And so those are the kind of conversations that we like to have. Now we couldn't do this if we didn't have sponsors. Um, so I'm going to thank them, and if I can read this, so Citywide Banks, who's been a long supporter of mental health all across the Denver metro area, Valak, can you read that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, who's the sp who, who wrote the sponsors down? There's one really important sponsor that I can't read their name. That's terrible. So, um, boy, we'll figure that out before the end of this thing is over. Anyway, I'd also like to... Uh, is somebody fixing this? Ah. There they are. Oh, of course. It's you, Anderson Mason Tail. <laughs> and then uh, in Colorado Access. Um, and I'd also like to thank our host committee. They're all the folks that kind of like help pull these things together. And uh, they're also involved in our Gifts of Hope um, breakfast that we have every year, where we bring the community together and talk about what's happening in our world. So um, our board of directors, many of which are here tonight, and many of which are spending all day tomorrow in a retreat to talk about where we go on the next level of our journey. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of them. So, um, so we do know that um, all communities have strengths. And I want to give you an example of a community that we worked with. Um, we did win an international award from the International Association of Public Participation. 
And this was our project, the Dahlia Campus for Health and Well-Being. And I'll tell you what happened there. We were looking for a place where um, there was a need for a community, um, and we wanted to see if we could do something to help people get what they needed. And I don't know if you know this, but if you have mental health in your name, neighborhoods don't necessarily open up their arms to you, right? <laughs> And uh, this was a community where that's kind of was our experience in a way. Um, they were worried about all the stereotypes that people have about mental illness. You know, they were, they were talking about, we're, we're a community, you know, that, um, that, you know, has not had a lot of privilege and um, there have been difficulties here and our concern is you're gonna put crazy people in our neighborhood. That's really what we heard. But as we were talking to the community about what they needed um, to thrive in that community, we went from this concept of having um, a clinic to having an urban farm, aquaponics, a gym, uh, a community kitchen, because that's what the community said that they needed. And I think it was the conversations and the deep conversations that we had with the community of why we won that award. So um, we know everybody in this room, you have things that you are naturally good at. And our approach to all the people that we see is how do we leverage what you're good at to get to where you want to be in the world. Um, our Sanderson apartment project um, was a really interesting experience. So you may know that Denver has a homeless population and um, some folks have been homeless for a long time. In fact, there are about 400 people in Denver that have been homeless for over 10 years. Now, if you're homeless and you live in the city, do you, are you a resident of this city? Like maybe you are, right? And we know how difficult it is to get well if you don't have a place to live. So we actually did this apartment um, with the idea of creating a space where people could thrive. And I will say there are people thriving there. It's amazing how quickly people can get better when they have a home. So um, I'm gonna get right to the panelists. We're really lucky tonight to have the people that are here. Uh, each one of them is going to talk for a, a little bit about their viewpoint around smart growth and, and what we can do around equitable growth in Denver. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion. And then you're invited to also like write down questions that you would like me to ask and people will collect those from you. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it and uh, I'm going to introduce each one of them and then ask Beth to come up. So Beth Mosenthal is an architect. Uh, she deeply understands that our environment can either help us or not so much. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about that. She is with Anderson Mason Dale, which was the architectural firm that we used for the Dahlia project. And then Jeff Romine, he's a chief economist. He's with the Denver Office of Economic Development. So he's uh, one of these guys that understands, like, how do you do these sorts of things in a way that not only promotes economic growth that's done in a fair and equitable way. And we are very lucky to have Senator Rhonda Fields, who is an advocate. She's a senator um, in uh, District 29 right. over in Aurora. And uh, we were talking earlier, she's about things moving forward and not moving back and making sure that people who have not had access in the past have access in the future. So with that, Beth, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. <coughs> okay. Make sure this works. Well, good evening. My name is Beth Mosenthal, and tonight I'm speaking to you as an architect, but also as a Den Denver resident that's very invested in our community, and as an advocate for big picture design thinking, as it relates to Denver's ongoing development. So tonight's charge, how do we make Denver a most livable and equitable city for all? It's a big question. Well, let's start with the question from a design perspective. What defines a livable city? 
Surprisingly, if you do a Google search, this is a little bit harder than you would think. What distinguishes a livable city from an eco city, a green city, a sustainable city, a smart city, an intelligent city, a resilient city? I'm exhausted. <laughs> I think um, urban planners have a harder job than architects keeping up with the trends. But um, as a baseline, I think we need to assume that all of these types of cities have similar and common attributes that inherently make a city more livable and equitable. And so the first one is this notion of walkability. Um, excuse me. A variety of housing types, uh, a mixture of land uses, preservation of open space, civic places and spaces, and job opportunities for all, <coughs> respecting community character and local heritage, quality educational facilities, and different types of transportation options. But what really distinguishes the concept of livability from all of these other ideas is that in the words of Hilda Blanco, livability is a human standpoint. How does a place, a city, support human life in its many dimensions. While sustainable design, which you've probably heard that buzzword quite a bit, addresses the impact of development on a global scale, livability not only asks us to think about how to design as stewards of the Earth's resources, it focuses on how design of cities can either support or prevent access to basic human rights. What's exciting about tonight's conversation is that we aren't just talking about livable cities, we're talking about livable cities through the lens of equity. And surprisingly, those two terms can actually undermine one another. Urbanist Karen Chappell talks about this tension. She writes, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development defines livability as a community with multiple modes of transportation, different types of housing, and destinations located close to home. But the popularity of livability is due to this global phenomenon of cities trying to become entrepreneurial and attract entrepreneurs and, you know, with fancy new amenities and, uh, you know, all those things that would attract new residents and what's happening in Denver. And she says that equity is an afterthought. And as we all know, this quote really hits close to home. Denver is growing and changing at what feels like breakneck speed. And so the more conversations we can have, that introduce equity into the conversation are critical to shaping cities that are not only meeting new residents' needs and desires for a livable city, but meeting the existing community's needs and supporting their aspirations, which also supports stability and economic mobility, which benefits everyone. So tonight I'd like to briefly touch on the livable characteristics I just mentioned transportation, different housing types, and resources close to home, and how we might begin to introduce more equitable thinking into related future design and planning solutions. From a transportation standpoint, equity comes with far-reaching access and implementation. Once a multimodal planning strategy, so in other words, a strategy that implements modes such as walking, cycling, automobile, public transport, one of the most critical aspects to implementation is that the design of each transportation system works in concert with the other. So the idea is that if you want to walk to work, or you want to drive, or you want to take public transportation, you feel safe and supported doing all of those things. You're not walking on a three foot wide sidewalk, you know, worried that you're going to get hit or something like that. So we have to really think about how all these systems work together. So this is just a really quick example, but if we look at this kind of common street section, let's see if this works, what you'll usually find is, I mean, parking, parking, automobiles, right, that are moving, and then potentially a bike lane. Um, they call these sharrows in Denver in some places where you'll see the arrow and someone will be on their bike, but someone might be trying to park. And then you'll have, you know, the pedestrian who's kind of blocked by a small median. And so what a lot of cities are starting to do now is they're starting to rethink this section so that maybe you have parking on one side, two lanes for vehicles, a protected bike lane that's two ways, and then a, that kind of provides a double, bi double buffer to the pedestrian. And then, I mean, we all know a lot of cities as well that really look to take those other transportation options and get them out of the pedestrian's way. So that's kind of an idealized scenario, but is being implemented 
in a lot of cities globally. And so I thought this was also a wonderful example. But as people begin to utilize different types of transportation, one might look to Bogota for a lesson in democratic planning. Every Sunday, part of Bogota's transit network transforms into a non-motor vehicle system. Instead of cars and buses, more than 100 kilometers of streets are filled with cyclists, roller skaters, joggers, and walkers of all ages, social classes, and races. In one of the most interesting expressions of democracy that has happened in Colombia, the Ciclovia, or cycleway as they call it, has become a vibrant space for the coexistence and celebration of diversity. So imagine this on Spear Boulevard or Colfax every Sunday. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, from, a <laughs> from a housing perspective, research has continually illustrated that equity is found in both adequate supply and options. On a personal level, we can all relate to the fact that housing is not one size fits all. Each person's living situation and preference is different, but what unites us is that as cities grow, so do the cost of land and so does the cost of housing. These are there are currently a variety of strat strategies that promote affordable housing and increased density. So I'm just gonna list a few that are kind of applicable to Denver. So one thing that's currently under a lot of debate and discussion is the notion of accessory dwelling units. And really what that is, it's a secondary house or apartment that shares the building lot of a larger primary house. ADUs, as they're called, are an incredible opportunity to increase density within existing desirable neighborhoods while providing housing options at price points that can promote multi-generational living, access to a starter home, or provide income to homeowners that might otherwise be priced out. On the topic of equity and dignity, a return to multi-generational living, supportive of aging in place, is something I could go on about. In Colorado, one in five people are projected by 2040 to be over the age of 65. And really, this is a global phenomenon. Birth rates are declining, people are getting older. That's just kind of where we are in the spectrum right now. So co-housing, which is a model, this is just an example from um, the city of Iowa, it provides people with an option of living in a purchased residence, but with built-in access to amenities, such as common spaces, a yard, gardens, recreation spaces, dining spaces, and a kitchen that can accommodate group, me group meals or gatherings. According to the AARP, the point of co-housing is community, and being able to live independently without living entirely alone. So this really supports kind of intergenerational living versus just you know, one demographic of the population. Cities such as Seattle that are struggling to maintain affordable housing options due to the success of local businesses such as Amazon is already demonstrating that increasing housing supply can also help lower housing prices. In the course of a one year period from 2017 to 2018, rents dropped for a single family residence by 25%. So how did they do this? <laughs> they call it the, um, according to an article in The Economist, the decline is owed to the frantic pace of building. This development has been enabled by the grand bargain, as they call it, in which restrictions and regulations were reduced by develop for developers in tandem with an inclusionary zoning policy. So for all those new developments, a range of about 5 to 11 percent of the actual units um, were meant to be rented below market rate. There are mixed views about whether or not this percentage is truly inclusionary, but it is an example of a strategy that yielded lower housing prices. Finally, while Jeff and Rhonda may be able to speak to housing as it relates directly to the city of Denver and the programs in place are being developed, it's worth mentioning that while we all know providing affordable housing options is critical, diversity in location is also important. So some people might really love living in the city center, but others might want the option to live in the suburbs. So we need to think about housing from a regional perspective rather than just an urban perspective. From a resource and community perspective, equity comes with inclusivity and community engagement. Planners and architects must talk with as many user groups as possible that are impacted by a future development, such as the example that Carl Clark showed. And so if we look at the Dahlia campus, <laughs> actually one of my colleagues who worked on the project is here. Matt Weaver's in the audience. Matt, do you want to wave? So if you have questions, <laughs> if you have questions after, you can find him. <laughs> but this is really, truly a, an incredible example of how, you know, where the project started is not where it ended. And so, 
you know, leading by example in terms of actually boots on the ground, walking around your community, finding out what's needed, is an, an amazing opportunity to really provide resources rather than, you know, thinking about satellite locations and more distance that people have to travel to meet their needs. Similar to the Bogota example, another strategy in creating access to public services in a growing city is just to rethink what's already there. So to rethink the use of existing public buildings and infrastructure. So this is a small example, but in the same way that Denver is thinking about the public library as a place to provide social services for our growing homeless population, Toronto is actually adding light therapy lamps so that while people read, they can combat seasonal affective disorder during the winter months. So that's a really small design tweak, but it's an important health service and I thought very innovative. Whether a project is private or public, we must think about how development interfaces with public space. How can a project support rather than ignore its immediate context and community? In conclusion, in light of tonight's event being hosted by the Mental Health Center of Denver, in addition to an increased focus on human-centered design, there's a growing recognition that design can and should play a central role in addressing today's complex health challenges. There's a lot of work to be being done to examine how design and public policy can help shape healthier built and natural environments, and as a byproduct, healthier people. While there's no one-size-fits-all strategy for any of this, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> Prioritizing development that leverages design to create environments that support livable, healthy, equitable outcomes should be a shared goal across industries, government, and society. So thank you. I'm Jeff Romine, I'm the Chief Economist for the city, but more importantly, um, I'm, the I'm right now the Director of the Neighborhood Equity Program within the City of Denver, um, and we're putting together a new, a new initiative that the Mayor proposed back in July. And that initiative is something called NEST, um, but more importantly it's called Net Neighborhood Equity and Stabilization Team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about OED as itself, because part of what has already been discussed is, is a little bit of the built form, but I want to talk a little bit about the activities that go in it and how we think about it from a city's perspective and, and how we therefore can address our community and bring it forward. So we have a number of divisions. This was created under former Mayor, um, Mayor Hickenlooper. OED was formed to include both housing, jobs, workforce development, as well as um, disadvantaged businesses, so minority and women-owned businesses. The goal here was to think about how all of those elements come together to create a community. And obviously, as we do that, we also work very closely with a number of other partners that I'll talk about when I talk <coughs> about the NEST program itself. But as OED came to be formed and as it continued to develop, what we've tried to do is figure out a way to create balanced opportunity. And that's really what the emphasis here is under, under each of the mayors I've, I've been able to serve and had the fortune and opportunity to lead different elements of it. So at one point I was in charge of housing, at one point I was in charge of bringing businesses to Denver and recruiting major firms to come here, uh, as well as maintaining the types of firms that we have in our neighborhoods. Um, so currently, as, you, as I've mentioned, I'm in charge of the neighborhood side of it, and what I think about is that, is it's a real blessing because in that particular venue, in that particular opportunity, I get to bring it all together. Because where we live, while oftentimes we talk about cities and we talk about metropolitan areas, we all cheer on the Denver Broncos and the Colorado Rockies, but in the end of it, where our truest connections are is at the neighborhood level. And that's what we're really trying to focus on today, um, both in our work, but also in this conversation. So as we think through and as we bring this together, what we began to realize as early as 2012 and 2013 is, is we saw a coming problem. Yes, we were just starting to emerge from a recession, some, one of the most difficult recessions we've ever had in this country, but we already began to see that there was going to be changes, dynamic changes with our neighborhood, because while the economy was moving forward, more importantly, we saw a return to the city that had begun in the late 90s and had really accelerated. Added to that, 
the changes that were going on economically caused what I sometimes refer to as a significant burst in capital coming into the city. The, the best and prime example that everybody thinks about is the Rhino District around, along Brighton Boulevard. But it's happening throughout the city. But the part of the story that sometimes gets lost when we think about neighborhoods is at the same time that's going on, there are neighborhoods within our city, such as College View and some other areas within the city where we're still seeing disinvestment, where we're seeing families struggling, where we're seeing housing prices not keeping up with those around the rest of the city. And so we see a change in the city, but more importantly, a change in every neighborhood. And that's really what gentrification and voluntary displacement and the NEST program is about. And so as you think about it, it is, and, I, and as I talked and thought about what I was going to discuss tonight, I began to think that this is very similar to what, what mental health is about, is, is you have to treat the immediate need, the immediate issue, but at the same time, you're oftentimes wanting to spend more time and more effort on preventative, changing the environment, changing the, the, the conditions that cause some of those unique conditions to affect us individually and collectively. And so in that same way, what we began to think about and what the mayor really started to bring forward is, is yes, gentrification is the major issue right now, but at the same time we have to think about it more broadly. Four years ago I had the fortune, um, the city requested that I attend a, 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 one of those boring and dry economic conferences you go to in, in Washington, D.C. Um, I found it very fascinating. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing, but uh, the former board chair, uh, Janet Yellen, was, was one of the keynote speakers. And what she said, which I still think is one, of, is one of the most profound things I've heard ever said by a Fed chair, was the most important economic issue of this generation and probably the next is going to be around economic mobility and how we are seeing changes and how we're seeing those manifest into opportunities within our community. One of the greatest um, uh, uh, scholars right now, Raj Chatty, who works a lot on economic mobility, has said that he believes that the American economic opportunity ladder is still there. The rungs have just gotten further apart. And when you think about that, that's our challenge as a society. That's our challenge as a city. That's our challenge as a group of nonprofits and partners and private individuals to say, how are we going to make sure people have those same opportunities? Because quite frankly, that's the stress. You know, as an economist, I don't think that much about money and finance. I think more about choice. It's always interesting. Everybody thinks economists are all about the money and always trying to put everything into dollar terms. In truth, what economists try to think about is the choices that were presented. And as has already been pointed out, that's what gentrification, that's what city or neighborhood building is about. It's about the choices that are before us. When I saw the Dahlia slide, the first Dahlia slide, the thing that wasn't highlighted was perhaps the most important part of that slide. And it's not to diminish what is happening on that campus, which is an absolute complete wonder. If you saw it, it was education, food, community all coming together. What was also really important is it fit into a neighborhood. It, rep it recognized and strengthened that neighborhood. So as you saw in the gray background, rooftops surrounding that campus. And it's not about the isolation or the uniqueness of that. It's about how everything is brought together and woven and strengthened. And that's really what NEST is about, and that's what our goal is. So I would just like to conclude this element uh, of my, my comments, and that is, is the challenge before us is really about choices. It's about giving every family, every neighborhood, the opportunity to make choices that are best for them. And those choices will change over time. Right now, the challenge before us is around the challenges that oftentimes are keeping people in place. It's the loss of neighborhoods, the loss of identity. It's about maintaining the history. But sometimes that history doesn't have to be preserved in the sense of let's keep a dying store open, but let's make sure that we have those stories that built that community come forward. And let's make sure that we bring vibrant new changes in, but respect the past. So that's the first choice, and that's the one we're facing right now. But at the same time, all of us must remember that the next step, which has already been talked about today, is about opportunity. And it's about being able to choose where you live. So the Sanderson Apartments is about that. So first, it's about getting people into safe and secure housing. But secondly, 
what the Sanderson Apartments project really represents is how we're bringing it all together so that people can begin to move forward and to have the choices for tomorrow. And then the last step has already been mentioned. It's about how do we build our own mobility and our own wealth. And so sometimes that's around home ownership. But oftentimes, the first and most important key for economic mobility is around education. And to be successful in education, it starts with a family. Because as, as um, various scholars, Robert Putman wrote a new book called Our Kids. Um, and it just came out a couple of years ago. But what he really talked about is the opportunities and how that advances education when parents read to their children. And unfortunately, if you read that book, what you'll see is a, a dire statistic that when families are having to work two jobs, they're moderate income, then they don't have enough time to read to their kids. And so the kids fall behind from, an English, from a language standpoint, from a word recognition standpoint, and start school behind. So what, this, what we really need to be doing is investing in education at the family level. That means then we, edu we invest in education at the school level and beyond. And so when I say that, what this really is talking about is thinking about the activities within our community, the, the neighborhoods and how we structure them, it's about all of us investing together. Um, while I have the opportunity to help lead some of this and be able to help get people in place that will further advance these things, in the end, it's everybody in this room and beyond. And that's the challenge that we have before us. And that's why I'm happy to be here today and join in this conversation. So thank you. So good evening. good evening. Now I was raised in a Baptist church and we have call <laughs> and response. So when I say good evening, you're supposed to respond back. Good evening. Good evening. Right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I bring, bring you greetings from the state capitol where I serve under the capable leadership of John Hickenlooper. I serve in the state senate and I represent Senate District Number 29. That district starts at Koufax and Yosemite. And my district is one-third urban, one-third suburban, and one-third rural. I go down the I-70 corridor all the way to Deer Trail and Strasburg and Bennett and Byers and Saddle Rock and Southland and the Motor Mile over there by Havana and the Aurora Mall and the Anschutz Center. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of um, my district. And it's an honor to serve because I don't see myself as a politician, I kind of see myself as a policy maker. And what I'd like to do is to drive policy to kind of inform and to help all the work that you're doing. So I want to thank the organizers and the leaders at the Dahlia Center and all the work that you do because the work that you do, it takes a calling. It, it takes a passion to kind of do the work that you do because you see a lot of pain. You might see recovery. You might see resilience, but it takes skill and art to do the work that you do. So I want to thank you for all the work you do. I drove past the Dahlia, the Dahlia Center um, today as I was picking up my granddaughter. She has an internship over there. And when I drove by that center, it just made me smile because it's exactly what that community needed. And then when you gave your explanation about people were concerned about, you know, do they want that kind of facility, you know, in the community, I was thinking, yeah, but you know, I never thought about the stigma and the shame that goes along with mental health, especially in the African American community, because a lot of times we believe we should just suck it up and just deal with it without getting the kind of support that you need. And so when I think about the diversity of what you all are doing there with the preschool and the community garden and the community kitchen and just all the resources, it is good work. So thank you for doing that good work. I'm kind of jealous because we don't have what you guys have in Denver. We do have mental health services, but it doesn't look like that. And it's kind of chunky. You know, it's kind of a little bit there, a little bit there, and it's not all centralized. And I think that's strength and making sure that there's no wrong door. You know, when you go to that center, you can probably get connected to all kinds of resources. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the work that I've done and kind of share with you how I fit into this discussion. And I think I have some slides, don't I? OK. 
okay. Yeah. Do I just push this thing here? Okay, that's my city. I represent uh, Aurora. I have lived and worked in Aurora for over 35 years. And the Aurora is known for being the all-American city. And so these, these photos that I'm going to share with you is a part of a photo story that I had uh, some youth work with me on. Basically, I gave them some flip cameras, and I told them to go out and tell me what it's like to live in Aurora and tell me your story through pictures. And uh, they did. And these are just some of the few pictures that they show in reference to what it's like to live in, a, in Aurora when you may be undocumented, where uh, English may not be your first language, where maybe your, your parents are struggling, where they're working from paycheck to paycheck, where you might not have all the resources that you need, where there's a lot of trauma uh, in the home or in the school or wherever, but this is what they saw. So I'm going to give you just a picture. We have like 35 pictures, but I only brought seven. <laughs> so this, and I was kind of intrigued when I saw this picture. This first picture is at a bus stop, and you see all of those shopping carts there. And I asked the young man, I said, why did you take this picture? What's significant about this picture? What meaning does it bring to you? And he says that that's as far as I can take my groceries. So when you see shopping carts at a bus stand, that is as far as his family can take his groceries. So that was like just insightful for me. Why did you take this picture, young man? He says that that's the access that we have for food. So. When you see that, you look at the price, but you know, he wanted to have more access to fresh fruits and vegetables. But he wanted to share the impression of the kind of um, access that he has of affordable food. And so he took a picture of these hot dogs. Why'd you take a picture of this young man? And he says, that's the only place where I see growth. You probably can't see it, but you see the earth is cracking, and there's a little bit of crabgrass that's growing there in this kind of dried up field. And that's the only piece of life and growth that he sees in his neighborhood. By the way, we showed this to city council, um, these pictures, and it was an eye-opening experience for them because a lot of them don't live in the neighborhood that these young kids live in. And uh, they don't see the same things that they see. This um, is a picture of a playground. I said, why did you take this picture, young man? And he says, because this is where I'm supposed to play and there's no swing on this swing set. So not is there you know, good food, because they're moving King Supers and Safeways out of our community and they're bringing in these ethnic groceries and it's just different and there's no safe places for our kids to play. And when they do have a safe place to play or a place to play, there's no swing set there. This is where some of the um, families live. So if you can't afford a house, if you notice all up and down East Colfax, we have a slew of hotels, motels. And we have people that are trapped in those hotels. They've been living there generational, you know, like 10 years. And when you think about how much they're paying on a weekly basis, time a month, they could be probably renting a place, but they're stuck in these hotels. And that's where they live, all up and down Colfax. And if you go inside some of these facilities, they're not maintained very well. We have other pictures. I didn't bring them, but the facilities inside are just, uh, bed bugs, they're not very clean, they're not fully stocked kitchens, and uh, it's a difficult situation. This is how they do their banking. So a lot of them don't have access to a, a citywide bank or to a key bank. So they get their checks cash at a payday lending place where a lot of times they take out a, a portion of their check 
And, um, but that's how they do their banking. And that was important for him to show that they don't have access to regular banking situation. And of course, they see this all day long, all up and down uh, Colfax's. They'll see people digging in garbage cans or what have you, looking for food, or this person is trying to recycle plastic bottles. And this is a picture that just talks about the over-policing in our community. There's a sense that there's too much policing in the community where they don't see that same type of policing taking place, let's say, in Centennial or Highlands Ranch or, you know, wherever. But the over aspects of policing, which might mean you might get pulled over, you might get ticketed, and there's this concern and this fear that oftentimes when they see the police, they don't see them as trying to protect and serve. They, they see them as um, a threat. Okay, that's the end of my slides. So that's a little bit about um, what's going on in Aurora. What we were able to do with those photos is we shared them with city council and we helped, that, those photos helped us inform a community center that I now have. I have a community center that's at 1445 Dayton Street and basically they were able to drive what we do there at that community center. We provide um, medical, primary medical care service for the undocumented and the uninsured. And it's hosted and, and uh, conducted by Anschutz Medical Center. So Anschutz Medical Center and their faculty comes over and they provide services. And when it comes to mental health, we do provide mental health as well, dentistry. But as I close and take my seat, there is so many people that are walking around in trauma. I see it every day because I have to go down Colfax to get to the Capitol. You probably see it as well. And I know what pain looks like because I've lived through pain. If you know anything about my story, my son was murdered in 2005. So I know what pain looks like and I know what pain feels like. But the only way I was able to navigate my trauma from pain to where you see me right now, it was through a therapist. It was through counseling that was able to get me through. Not only counseling, it was my faith, my community, resources that just wouldn't let me lay down and give up. So just never give up on anyone because there's always an advocate, a parent, a teacher, a pastor, your neighbor, your friend, that'll help anyone get through a situation, but you have to be willing to ask for help, you have to be willing to accept help, and I want to thank you for always being there. Thank you. So I have questions that actually, we're, we're streaming this. And we have people that are online that are watching. And uh, they sent some questions in ahead of time of things that they were interested in. So we're going to have a conversation. Great. And uh, the first question is for everybody, which is, why is equity important? So you, first? Yeah. you know, um, equity is important because we don't all come into this world equally. So kids don't have a choice into the kind of families that they're born into. So some kids, when they're born into a family, they may have all the resources and then some might not have the resources that they need. So there is a difference between equity and equality. So equality is where every might, might be the same, like you, everyone gets one book. But some kids might need two or three books to get to that equity point. So for me, equity means making sure that kids and families and, and folks have the adequate resources that they need to be productive and contributing members of society. And that includes making sure that you have all the needs met, food, housing, clothes, jobs, and those kinds of things. And some folks need more than others based on their status in reference to what resources they have to be um, able to make it. And it's just not easy. So that's why equity is so important because we have so many people that just don't have it. 
And as a society, I think it's our responsibility to help folks that don't have it. So I know people think you should pull yourself up by the bootstraps, but some people might not have boots. And I think that America and our state and the Colorado way, we're big enough that we can help families and, and kids and people that are in need. Right. Yeah, I think, I guess I'll speak from the design perspective, but one thing that I've witnessed in my own practice over the years is that, and we were just having a conversation before this, is that a lot of times we'll see things like accessible design, but when you see a building or a public space that is what's truly inclusive or equitable, that you know everyone has the same front door and easy access to get to that front door and then to circulate through the building without having to separate from the person that they were talking to because you're in a wheelchair and that person's going to take the stairs. Those things, they can be grading on a daily basis. And so when I think about equity in the built environment, what I'm passionate about and what excites me is this idea that rather than you know, meet the code minimum, that we could start thinking about places and spaces that are easily accessible for all, but kind of go beyond that and feel equitable and enjoyable so that people really you know, feel included in their built environment, you know, regardless of neighborhood or space and whether it's civic or private. Um, so that's just something that, it's an issue of equity that I feel I need to advocate for constantly. And I would just, one of the things that was just mentioned is, is there's two sides to this coin, or not two sides, I shouldn't say it that way, but there's two elements that need to be thought about and, and brought together, and that is equity and inclusiveness. And when you think about that, that's really what we're trying to create as a society and what we've been trying to create as a society for a long period of time here in Colorado, uh, but in the U.S. as a whole. And, and making sure that we have those choices, making sure that we're listening and, re and, and respecting people for where they come from and what they brought to the, to the conversation. Um, one of the things that, that oftentimes we try to do is, is we forget about time. And we forget about how things happen over periods of time. And, and we can strive and we can try to fix things now. Um, but oftentimes, the real part of equity comes th through making, allowing choices to occur appropriately. And what I mean by that is, is sometimes what we have to do is think about the next generation and making sure that that generation has the choices and the opportunities that, quite frankly, some of us didn't have. Um, and I've met person after person over the years. and. Oftentimes, you know, they'll tell the story of their parents or their grandparents and what the, the sacrifices that were made in order to give their children or their grandchildren choices. And that's really what this is about. Um, you, you know, as we think about equity and as we think about inclusiveness, we oftentimes have to remember that this is about creating a community that's tomorrow. Um, that doesn't mean we give up on today. That doesn't mean we try to strive for certain things. But it is about making those long-term investments um, and making sure that we're doing it in effective manners. And, and that's, that's the difficult part of this, is building communities of, that serve us today, but more importantly, create tomorrow. One of the things that one of the mayors once said to me as I was working on a project he, is he literally said to me, he said, I want to make sure that, that when somebody walks into that building, um, it's going to be a multifamily building, that no one can ever point to a door and say, that's where the poor people live. Um, because that's the real reality. Yeah. And so within Denver, at least, and I think this is increasingly true around the metropolitan area in the, in the country, is we allow mobility of that unit. So if you think about it, if we were to fund, and, and you'll understand this, but if we were to fund a 50-unit uh, multifamily home or a building, that it's not apartment 101 that's the affordable unit. There is a affordable unit for somebody that's making 50% of the, of the median income here. But it might be 101 one year, it might be 302 the next year, and et cetera. So that the stigma that oftentimes young children don't feel, but all of a sudden once they get into middle school, they start saying, what do you mean, I, I don't get those same things? It's about making sure that those choices and those children recognize that they have the opportunities of this society. Great. So <laughs> this is coming from me, not from the list. So we run into um, many conversations where people say that they do believe in equity and that they think that people should have opportunity. 
uh, but not in my neighborhood. So what's your, what's your take on that or your response to that? Me, I guess. I, uh, why don't I go first because I'm okay. going to bridge something. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the senator talked quite a bit about Colfax. Um, and, and, you know, Colfax is, is one of those great roads that run across the metropolitan area, actually. Um, and in this particular case, there's, a, there's an example I wanted to bring up, which is actually counter to that. So um, the city and county of Denver, through our department, has purchased two pieces of property near Aurora, but on the Denver side, um, that are in what's called East Colfax. It's a neighborhood within the city. Um, when you go into that neighborhood, what you see is, is, as the senators pointed out, is older 1940s and 50s motels. Um, and so we've, we purchased a couple of properties. Neither of them were hotels. One of them happened to be a former dance club, which was a st uh, strong stable in the community for a number of years. Um, and then somebody decided to paint a little extra sign on that that said nude. Um, and so it operated for a number of years as a nude dancing site. So we ended up purchasing that. About six months ago, um, the two council members for that dist for the, on, on either side of Colfax held a community meeting. And this was the part that really surprised me. That East Colfax neighborhood, that place where if you go two blocks off or even a block off that street, you can see an incredible amount of pride of ownership in a changing neighborhood right now. It's incredible when you do that. Um, and it's night and day almost to what you see literally on East Colfax. But those neighbors came together and at the request of both council members said, what do you want the city to do with those two pieces of property? And that community group, and it was roughly 60 residents on a Tuesday night, one of the things they said is, we think that there's a homeless problem in our community, and we think homeless housing should be an element of at least one of these properties. And I gotta tell you, I've told that story to a number of people, and to a person, we can't think of any other neighborhood we've ever heard that said, we want affordable housing in our community. And they went further and said, we want to make sure there's the supportive services. We want to make sure there's food access. And they began to list through what the community valued. And I think, you know, uh, uh, you know Dr. Clark, that, that is changing. That evolution in our neighborhoods is beginning to say, this isn't just always about me and kind of protecting my little world. It's about being part of a larger world. And I think that's coming through in architecture. And I think it, quite frankly, came through both the SIB project, the Sanderson um, apartments as well as the Dahlia, that, that the community starts saying, this actually makes us stronger and makes us better, um, when we reflect those values. Yeah, so Dr. Clark, you're saying the question is, I, I like equity, but I don't want to pay for it. I like equity, but I don't want it in my neighborhood. In my neighborhood, okay, now I got it. So that is a common theme. We hear that in the healthcare debate. I have insurance, but I don't care if you don't have it, kind of a thing. And we hear it as it relates to education, where we underfund our schools over a billion dollars. And the funding model is based on property wealth. So if you live in a community that has lots of property wealth, you, you get more state funding than others. But if you live in a rural part of the uh, state, then your per people funding is not the same. And a lot of it's based on, you know, I'll pay for my section over here. And you know, I'll deal with this because it's in my community and how you get yours, you know, I don't wanna pay for that. And so we have to start um, moving that mindset, shifting that mindset that it's not, because I, it's not my kid in that school. It's our future, it's our community, it's our state. And we have to start shifting what we value. And oftentimes what we value, we're not funding adequately because everything may be good in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And you talked about Colfax. Um, and there's still pockets, you know, that center that you have in Dahlia could be replicated in other locations. We're trying to do that. <laughs> good, come to Aurora. <laughs> but, um, but it's like, there's some communities. We, we hear in the city, you know, like if there's gonna be a, a transition housing, let's say for people who are just being released, from a jail and they need housing, a lot of those folks, these communities don't want them in their neighborhood. And so we just have to work on creating a different mindset that we're all in this together, that we're all a part of a collective good, and we all need each other, and we just have to find a way to find agreement as it relates to, you know, we all share the roads. We all share the same air. 
And so it has to be okay that we support each other. That's what our government is all about. It's about supporting our infrastructure, which means it's already built into our environment. You really can't say, no, I'm not going to, because you know we share the same water, we share the same roads. So that would be my take on it. So I'm going to um, do a little uh, psychiatry here, right? Um, so I'm going to just mention a little bit about uh, well-being. And uh, following up on your, that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. So the science of well-being um, has not been around that long, um, just about 20 years. But one of the things that we know from the science of well-being is that if you have a friend whose well-being is good, it has a 15% influence on your well-being. Mm -hmm. If you have a friend who has a friend whose well-being is good and you don't even know them, it has a 6% influence on your well-being. And it goes the opposite direction. The percentages aren't the same. <coughs> but if you know somebody whose well-being is not good, it's 6% to the negative. Mm -hmm. So when we think about it in terms of the community, mm -hmm. if we help the well-being of everybody in our community, mm -hmm it comes back to everybody in our community. It's good. So. Yeah, it's interesting from, in an urban planning lingo, there's, um, have, have you heard of NIMBY? Not in my backyard. But in San Francisco, there's a movement towards FIMBY, with a PH, public housing in my backyard. And I thought that was wonderful, because I think to Jeff and Rhonda's point, the climate is changing, and I think a lot of that is based on education, as we're talking about, educating people in our neighborhoods to understand that if you provide affordable housing options in what we might call a resource-rich area with good mm -hmm. schools, you know, good resources, healthy food, things like that, those people are destined to have more economic mobility in the future. And so I think educating people that those decisions benefit everyone are the first step at really, you know, changing people's perceptions about closer to being FIMBY supporters. Great. If you do have questions, there are people at the end of the aisle. Oh, maybe they already sent me some. Ah, very good. Okay, as our population grows, how do we include parks, activity green spaces, and smart growth? <laughs> looking at the, the city of Denver. I know I, I can't speak on behalf of the city, but I, I can say, um, having been in, engaged in some of the Denverite uh, Blueprint Denver process, I think what's really exciting about Denver is that currently what they've been doing is going into each neighborhood in Denver and doing what I've been talking about, engaging users to understand kind of the existing climate, their needs, the aspirations for the community, and then opportunities for growth and density that we've been talking about in terms of adding development, but hopefully in a sensitive manner that still respects kind of existing context and character. And so through those neighborhood plans, my understanding is that Blueprint Denver just was issued for final comment. So it's not too late. You can actually go onto the city's website and review Blueprint Denver and provide feedback in regards to you know, neighborhood plans, and those incorporate things like green space and parks. So this is really the city of Denver taking a big look at, you know, planning for the future and understanding that you do need green space, but we also need more housing. And so how do the pieces of the puzzle kind of come together in the future to make sure that they're providing for the immediate and future needs of the community? Right. I love the graph that you showed in reference to where they had uh, bikes on one oh, yeah. side and people were walking on one side and I think that that's innovation I would like to see more of that you know in our city where there's no cars where there's just biking and people walking and we just need to make sure that we build that into communities that we're developing making sure that there's access for the, the handicap and bikers and walkers and dogs and we just need to be visionary that way so it's not just a, a building right. with yeah. 1,400 units or something like that. Right, absolutely. And, and since Beth started the commercial, I'll finish a little bit of the commercial. <laughs> um, and, and there's actually something called Denver Right, which is the broad scheme. There's four actual plans that are going through right now. Denver Right, 
Um, and so you can go online and look that up. But Blueprint Denver is one of the four plans moving forward. At the same time, there's something called Game Plan, which is around the parks planning process. And there's a mobility, both a transit mobility and a trails and, and uh, bike paths plan. So all four of those plans are moving through together. What that really represents is, is this is the city deciding that rather than doing a one-off plan, and not that a, not Blueprint Denver is necessarily a one-off plan, but recognizing that mobility and neighborhoods and the balanced growth and, the, and creating a community takes all those elements coming together. Um, and we talk quite a bit about that and making sure that there are accessible parks. The reality is, is this is a very built city. There are some places that are still green, uh, from the standpoint of new development up in the northeast. Uh, but relatively speaking, this is a built city. And so one of the things that we're doing, and I'm going to kind of return it a little bit, I'm sorry to not just talk about parks, but to return it a little bit broader. Up at 38th and um, the Brighton corridor area, right where the new light rail station is opened on the, on the A-line, um, that, that area, we put in a new overlay district, which was something brand new that no one's ever done in the country. We are effectively a little bit of a pilot and that is is what we're saying is we'll give you a, di a an increase in height and in exchange for that you're going to build affordable housing within those developments that that's a step further than what we used to do with our IHR inclusionary housing ordinance and council took this initiative based upon the mayor and Brad Buchanan who's our planning directors idea which is that we need to create a whole community and that whole community is already pointed out includes people of all income levels, of all ethnic and, and a rich diversity of background. You know, as an economist, I will tell you that the greatest place where we're seeing segregation is not around race any longer, at least in Denver and most of the country. What we're seeing segregation around is education and income. And so that's where we really need to make sure that we're creating the diversity within our communities, is that people of moderate incomes and moderate means and um, you know, but, but want to live in the same neighborhood as somebody who's wealthy. That's the real, that's the real challenge of segregation at this point. Um, and if you look at place after place after place, you, it's the, the racial barriers have broken down quite a bit, which is great. But now what we've replaced them with is educational separation. And, and if you think about it, that's, that's changing the dialogue and that's changing a lot of what um, we're seeing around the country, but more importantly in a community. So as we look at this balanced community, that balance really does require that we make sure that we have a range of housing options, a ranging of jobs, so that what we end up with is, is moderate income people living near wealthier people, that people are able to meet and mingle because that's where the richness of idea comes from, not from all of us of the same education or the same income, mm -hmm. but from where we can exchange ideas and we can get creative um, I, I oftentimes when I work on entrepreneur um, things and I talk about it, you don't need an MIT, uh, an MBA from MIT or Harvard to start a business. You can be a 16-year-old going to Kennedy. They have an entrepreneurial program right now, and those kids are thinking about what business they want to start. And what a great way to start a business when you're 18 because you don't have to worry about losing your house. You don't have to worry about your children or your wife or husband divorcing you if you fail in your business. It's all great, um, and so risk is something that the youth knows how to handle well, better than most of us. Um, and so entrepreneurism starts at any age, and that's true, is that's where we get the richness of our culture. Great. So how can we incentivize diversity and break cycles of disadvantage early on, rather than being reactive? It's a complicated question. <laughs> How can we incentivize diversity? Well, you know, I don't think we need to incentivize diversity because we live in a diverse world. And, you know, you just cannot um, control that, you know, because our population is who we are. And so, you know, you're just, you're just born into it. Like I didn't have a choice in reference to the color of my skin or wh whoever you are. I mean, you, you know, you can't incentivize that. You just have to accept it. And it just has to be a part of who we are. So it has to be a sense of tolerance. 
as it relates to breaking the cycle, I think you talked about that in reference to education. Education is the equalizer. And so we need to make sure that all of our kids get the quality education that they need. That means that they need to have a healthy start, a safe start, to set them up for success. So that could be early childhood education, preparing them for kindergarten, and those kinds of things. But I think education is a way for breaking the cycle. Because what you have is you have generational poverty. And a lot of it's based on lack of achievement. Maybe there's issues as it relates to reading or, or not having the economic resources to, to find a good paying job. And so they drop out of school to um, work and to help their family. So we have to find a way that would create equity and access for employment, for housing, and those kinds of things. And I think that's how you break the cycle. I think what we need to do is to work upstream. And that's as early as we're possible. Because this pipeline to prison school, to prison pipeline, is real. And we're starting to already identify kids early on. And we're putting them in the criminal justice system. So we have to work upstream to break that cycle. And I believe that education is one of the, the, the equalizers, as well as employment and housing and health care and those kinds of things. So a lot to this question you want to say. Uh, um, I mean, I would echo everything Rhonda said. And, and I think absolutely that idea of access that we've been discussing all evening is so critical. I think one thing that we didn't mention on the Dahlia campus that was fascinating was that the construction site, people could actually sign up for a job each okay. day. I like that. Yeah, and so they were able to, you know, get daily wages and they were put oh, to work great. doing something on the job site. And I thought that was a really interesting way to engage community and access like and conversations. And so a small example related to access, but how do you start with these really small things um, to create a ripple effect in a community? And, and I would, the only thing I would add here is, is that that's one of our challenges, and, and quite frankly, I would argue that's a little bit of our failure at this point, is, is we have become a society um, at times, and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll share in this, um, where we, we react. Um, we're not being as proactive as we possibly can, and that, that requires us to think and, and have data. And so the example that I would use, and, and while it's, it's partially an incentive perhaps, but it's also being smart um, and thinking well about how we're going to invest, and that is, is if we wait for a neighborhood, you know, and there's a number of neighborhoods we could point to, if we wait for a neighborhood to change, and then we decide we need to make sure that there's affordable housing, or then we want to encourage home ownership, it's gonna be very expensive. It's gonna be very difficult to do. And quite frankly, it's probably not gonna help the people that were in that community <laughs> before, um, the original, re the quote unquote original residents. If we can anticipate where those changes are gonna come, and sometimes they come because the city or the state, or somebody's made a, or the private sector's made a major investment. Um, but you make an investment in a community and you, you can kind of anticipate some changes are gonna come. And so what we need to do is be smarter about it and be proactive as opposed to constantly being reactive. And so when the mayor talked, uh, you know, in a couple of the conversations we've had about NEST, he's asked, what is our goal? What are we trying to accomplish? And, the, and to me, and I'll just tell you what I answered with, is, is it's about us being able to think about what's going to happen to a community before it happens. And so if you think about it, that means that the neighbors that are living and renting a home, a single family home, but renting it in that neighborhood, and all of a sudden we invest or the private sector invests and that property prices go up $75,000 for the home. It's probably too late to get them qualified into home ownership and to help them with that first time home buyer. We have great programs in the metro area, such as home, you know, home buyer assistance programs and first time home buyer programs and things like that. But if we get there late, then we're fighting an uphill battle. If we can be there before the investment or as the investment's being made and we help those neighbors be able to buy that first home, then they can see that appreciation of that $75,000 rather than trying to swim against the current and, and do that. It's, so to me, the first incentive, if you will, is good information and, and trying to be proactive. Um, and that will help us get there. And that's part of what we're all trying to do and think through is not be reactive to these situations. Don't be a victim. Instead, let's make sure we take advantage of the change. 
So this question is for each panelist. How is each panelist working with communities to make sure there is diverse representation at the table when making plans for development? Yeah, I think that notion of user engagement that I talked about, I think it was interesting kind of looking in on, um, you know, there's the urban planning kind of user engagement, like what Denver right, and Blueprint Denver is doing, where they're going into communities and they're literally trying to meet with as many different members of that community as possible. And then conversations have come up about, well, not everyone can go to a community meeting at seven o'clock on a Wednesday night, especially if you have two jobs or you have kids. I mean, it, we live in the culture of busy, and so, What's interesting to me right now is that in part of the user engagement and design process is that there's a lot of different tools available to us now in terms of online surveys, online outreach, um, you know, different, different avenues available to kind of receive feedback. And so I think that that's something that is a trend that the design community needs to pursue even more aggressively so that when we are doing these kind of large scale development projects, that maybe it's a private developer, but if they're working in tandem with the city and they're working with kind of a responsible group of architects and land planners, um, how do you utilize that engagement process to really understand what you guys did for the Dahlia campus and understand the broad community needs and how even if it's a small facet of the project, it can begin to address the larger needs um, for the future. Yeah, and, and I use my role um, to make sure there's a lens of diversity and inclusion in, in everything that I do as it relates to, to public policy. Because I have a seat at the table, I use that seat to lead and to make sure that I'm asking the right questions as it relates to does it have some incorporation of um, diversity as it relates to different housing units. So if the city is engaged in certain projects, I'd like to try to make sure that there's going to be local hiring done. I'd like to make sure that some of our folks are included as it relates to uh, their voice because it's in their community and they're being impacted, but a lot of times they're not consulted. It's almost like someone didn't even think to ask. And what happens um, is that that's they, they're pushed to the side a little bit and the pain just gets pushed away i mean you have these shiny buildings but you can go a block away and you can still see the pain you can still see the hurt you see forgotten communities because someone wanted to develop a certain strip mm -hmm. so i'm always looking for did you consult with the community where's the voice of the community where's the voice of the neighbors and the friends and we all need to be asking that question it is hard because people are extremely busy right to be engaged. So as elected officials and community leaders, we need to make sure that we're pulling people to the table so we can get their voices at the table so that we can hear how it impacts them, how it impacts their community. And um, they just need to be a part of it because if we're not at the table, then we're on the menu. <laughs> and, um, and when you're on the menu, you have oil and gas development, you have a lot of things that goes on without your input. So we need more people at the table to make sure that we have diversity in thought. Great. Um, it, it, inclusiveness in a conversation starts in many different ways. And part of it is, is um, by making sure that we're inclusive ourselves. Um, and so thinking about how we react, um, both as staff and as various selected leaders and others, you, you know, there's a number of formal processes that we've all grown to accept. Um, and those are the things as mentioned. There are the seven o'clock town hall meetings. There are the Saturday morning um, whatever. We, we as a city, we as, as, as just um, in our various roles, both need to think about those impacts uh, on families and how to do that. And then also to be bilingual, to be, to be yes. multicultural. Yes. Um, and all of those things do matter. Um, you know, we have, uh, every 10 years, we have one of the greatest social um, experiments, I guess, is the way I would phrase it, where we try to count everybody in, a, in the country at one time. And this is going to be a challenge census, there is absolutely no doubt. And I use that as an example because as we think about those types of things, it's the same questions that we're trying to think about from the standpoint of any neighborhood. 
there are a bunch of people that do not feel comfortable ever showing up at a community meeting, ever. Um, and we've got to figure out how to reach out to them. And we strive to find different methods. And sometimes it's finding a community activist who is comfortable. It's sometimes it's, it's working with nonprofits. It's, it's about trust. And it really is about listening and learning from others. Um, and, and that's really what starts inclusiveness, um, is the ability to just be open up to an authentic voice. Um, and, and, you know, it's something that we're trying to learn. The other part, one of the other major initiatives that the mayor announced at the State of the City this year, um, it, you know, was somewhat lost to a lot of people because it just didn't resonate in the sense of something's going to happen, something's going to get built. And that is, is he made a real striving point to say the city must become inclusive. And we must figure out how to do that both as a staff but also as a community. Um, and so it's something that we're striving toward and it's something that I can tell you is part of the everyday work now is it's not good enough to have a council meeting on a Tuesday after or Tuesday at seven o'clock. We must reach out and get legitimate conversation going and listening and then being truthful in the answer. You know, we can't do everything, but we sure can be honest about that conversation. So how can I, as a resident of Denver, make a difference in building equitable communities? I like this question. I would call you a citizen. I, I mean, I, I'm a Denver resident. I, I, I you know, absolutely think that I, I should have voice in my neighborhood and I should have voice in how that comes. And I think I both have a responsibility and an opportunity in that. And the responsibility is I have to take advantage of when I have those opportunities as a citizen uh, to speak about my neighborhood and my community. But equally important in my role, I have to make sure that I'm listening to people about how, to, how they can come into that system. Um, so part of this is about expressing. Um, and, and, you know, we have 13 council members. We have, you know, uh, people all over the city. It turns out that I, somebody told me, to, reminded me today, I have 12,000 colleagues um, that work for the city. And inevitably, almost everybody knows somebody. Um, and those voices need to be brought forward. Um, and so that's really part of it is, is uh, we can do certain things from a city. We can do certain things through Denver Wright. We can do certain things through the city council members um, when they do work on neighborhood plans or in development. But the other part of this is, is we have a responsibility as individuals to say, I'm going to voice my opinion, or I'm going to voice the opinion of somebody that's not being heard. Um, because I'm talking to my neighbor and they don't feel comfortable coming to something. Um, and so it's a two-way street, it really is. And, and I think that's part of what um, the breakdown has been is, is oftentimes we as individuals feel voiceless and we have to realize that our voice is really what matters um, because it is our neighborhood, it is our community and so we must express it. So uh, I, I can't do it all from m my side when I wear this pen and when I come to some meeting. I, I hope that you'll do your part of it too, and that is, is tell me or send me an email. Um, I know who to send it to to make sure that something happens. If it's not me, I'm going to make sure that it's one or two persons away. Um, it's, a, it's a first person response in my opinion. Great. Any thoughts about how design might affect the occurrence and severity of addictions? Any thoughts about how design might affect the occurrence and severity of addictions? Yeah. I think one thing I can say about, um, about design and how it can help potentially is, and I'm sorry to keep using it as an example, but the Dahlia Center, um, that's a good example about a, kind of a growing trend in the industry as a whole of destigmatizing mental health services. And so related to that, I think there's a movement across the United States, you know, there's, it's very um, con controversial in regards to, um, you know, safe injection sites. But I think that there's a lot of conversations that are happening right now that are acknowledging that people have addiction, that are acknowledging that people might need access to mental health services or uh, you know, addiction services and things like that and potentially counseling. And maybe the first step is just providing an environment that feels safe, you know, where they can have a conversation or have access to resources that they might not have known are available. Great. 
Well, there's more questions than we have time for. So first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming out and having this conversation. So. Okay, that's the wrong way. So, um, so what can you do, right? You came out here to hear what people had to say, to have a conversation about this. Um, you can certainly look at us on social media if you like. Um, we do post a lot of things about these kind of topics, so I invite you to do that. Um, sounds like the city has opportunities to give input on what's happening around design and planning. Um, so we invite you to do that. And we do do our annual Gifts of Hope breakfast every year. Um, you're certainly welcome to learn more about what we do in trying to increase well-being in our city. And then the last thing that I'll mention is that we have a very interesting thing that's happening in Denver right now. You've probably read about it. Um, so we polled Denver residents saying, would you be willing to have a tax if it contributed to um, behavioral health treatment, right, for mental health and for addiction. And uh, it was actually uh, uh, Representative Le Leslie Harrod contacted me and said, you know what, this is, timing is right. People are talking about this issue. And um, I think that it's time to ask the voters if they want to do something. So we polled the voters to say, you know, if there was a 0.25% sales tax in Denver, um, would you support that uh, if the funding went to behavioral health? And the response was 79% support. It was pretty phenomenal. And so, yes, we're pretty excited about that. Um, so uh, I know that uh, Caring for Denver would love it if you connected with them too in some way to get the word out. Uh, it is a Denver initiative. Um, there are many things to like about it. I think part of it is even the shift that you saw in the neighborhood of saying we actually want affordable housing instead of a strip club. I mean, <laughs> who would guess? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so anyway, it's it's ways that you can be involved. And we do the speaker series periodically um, throughout the year. And so stay tuned and come back to our next event. And thanks for coming out.